Hey, it's Mike here, and today the Great Salt Lake is being called an environmental nuclear bomb, and it has made headlines in recent weeks, but none of those headlines include the specific main cause, which is super important and should not be ignored. But the basic story is that the shrinking lake is exposing the toxic lake bed, which could lead to heavy metal dust clouds forming and storms right near the highly populated Salt Lake City area. A mighty Great Salt Lake is drying up. This week, water levels in the Great Salt Lake in Utah hit an all-time low. A looming environmental nuclear bomb in Utah. And the state could face an environmental nuclear bomb. The drying lake is having a dramatic impact on its surrounding environment. The scientists now sending a dire warning if the lake keeps drying up. Getting to the point where Utah officials are even considering piping ocean water 800 miles from the Pacific to fill up the lake. Go home, Utah. You're drunk. Except you're not drunk because Mormons don't drink. Anyway, we're going to investigate this, look at some research papers, some government data, some historical comparisons of other lakes that are really important and more. So let's just go. Let's start off with some basics about the Great Salt Lake because you need to have a frame of reference to start from. First of all, ecologically, it's super important because it's a migratory stopover for 10 million birds, which is huge. So they've got to get from central Canada to central Argentina or southern Mexico without a stopover. You just can't do it. You have to refuel somewhere in the middle. It's also economically important because it brings in about one and a half to two billion dollars a year to Utah. And finally, despite it being a salty lake, about five times as salty as the ocean, it actually can drive weather patterns and create precipitation into the mountains that then creates drinking water. So just because it's salty doesn't mean it doesn't help with drinking water. And it gets a little iffy when you're talking about the size because while it is the largest lake west of the Mississippi, it's hard to pin down the actual size because, hey, 30 years ago, it was like the size of Puerto Rico at over 3,000 square miles. If you look it up, it might say 1,700 square miles on average, but now after you know July being the lowest recorded level, it is only about 900 square miles, a little bit bigger than the Hawaiian island of Maui. And it was already a really shallow lake. A lot of sources say it averages 14 feet deep, but it fluctuates a lot and it has gone down about 10 feet in the last 10 years, which is why people basically just have to take those air boats on it now. And as it lowers, the salinity increases, which is really sketchy ecologically because when it reaches a certain salinity level, then the base of the food chain, the brine flies, which are these little guys that stick on rocks and the brine shrimp population can collapse. And now in terms of how big it is, the lake has shrunk roughly 70% from its original size. I mean, they have Antelope Island, which is weirdly home to Buffalo, which is now just Antelope Peninsula. They were trying to keep them on the island and now they can just roam anywhere. I mean, anywhere. And now it's important to learn about that toxicity risk because it is a salty lake for the same reason that it can be a bit of a toxic lake because it's a terminal lake. Things that flow in do not flow out, nothing flows out. So naturally occurring heavy metals like arsenic over thousands of years can build up. And then we do have the occasional copper mine arsenic dumping that they might get caught for here and there. And one scientist and their team have put a ton of work into this issue and that is Kevin Perry from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Utah, here he is. You can see this wall of dust and it reduces the visibility, and people are very concerned about what might be in the dust uh, that they're breathing. He actually has a little machine that simulates high wind to see if there's a dust storm, and they've been measuring all sorts of toxins. It's a swirling wind inside this chamber that simulates wind speeds of up to about 50 miles an hour. And here he is again with the results, not good. Unfortunately, we found very high concentrations of arsenic in the soil. And arsenic is concerning for a variety of reasons. It can lead to lung cancer, skin cancer, bladder cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And it would be one thing if this was all out in the middle of nowhere where there was no one it could harm, but it is right next to a massive population. The Salt Lake City metro area has about 1.2 million and then the Ogden Clearfield area right next to it has about half a million more. And that's probably why Republican state lawmaker Joel Ferry, he referred to it as a environmental nuclear bomb. 
if we don't take some pretty dramatic action. And at this point I have to mention, this isn't just a theoretical, oh, this could happen situation. This is a, oh, we've seen this happen before, which brings me to Owens Lake, which was sucked dry by the population of Los Angeles. And from the EPA, a few years back, quote, Owens Lake emits about 300,000 tons of PM10 per year, which is a particulate matter. 30 tons of this is arsenic and nine tons is cadmium. And Owens Lake is the single largest source of PM10 pollution in the United States. And perhaps the most important point here is that Owens Lake, when it was full, was still only about 1 30th the surface area, 1 30th the size of the Great Salt Lake when it was full. So yeah, it's not looking good. And then of course the population is insanely different as I already mentioned, but people moved away from the shore of Owens Lake and with remaining people in the area, yeah, we have about 84 times as many in the Great Salt Lake area. And get this, even with that smaller lake in California, they have spent $2.5 billion on environmental cleanup for dust control. So keep that in mind. All right, now let's get into the causes of this and that main cause. And the first topic I need to briefly cover is climate change. That's because some claims around it have been made that don't appear to actually be backed by science. You know me, I am all about talking about the negative effects of climate change, but in this case, we have some nuance. From articles like this one from the World Economic Forum, they say climate change is causing lakes to dry up, leading to a number of unfortunate circumstances. The latest, they say, is the Great Salt Lake. Well, there has been a recent drought and climate change is making Utah hotter as this new index is showing. The lake has been shrinking for decades now and we have pretty good measurements of why that is occurring, the main drivers at least. As this 2020 paper written by scientists from the Department of Watershed Scientists at Utah State University, they say, quote, climate change to date has not noticeably influenced lake level. They say, no, it's really water flow upstream of the lake that is being diverted to other things. That is the main cause. And they've actually been measuring the amount of water before that diversion that would go to the lake directly and in the form of tree ring growth, which of course maps out how much water there is in a year. And from that, it appears they've been lucky in the area because they identified, quote, no long-term climate-driven changes to precipitation or stream flows in the past 150 years. But to counter that a little bit, there's likely some increases in evaporation from the lake directly from these hotter summers that are very likely amplified by climate change. However, not enough to make what's happening happen. And finally, in the coming years, climate change could be the final blow to a very vulnerable lake. That's the future. Let's get back to what's happening now. News article after news article mentions increasing residential populations, increasing residential populations. We'll get into the numbers of those in a bit, but even from this Utah government article, you know, you see per capita water usage and you think, per person, personal water usage, but that's just the total water usage divided by the population. It doesn't say where the water is going. So what's the breakdown? Well, looking at newer data from this 2019 report from the Utah Foundation using Utah Division of Water Resources data, the numbers are shocking. 82% going to ag in general. We're talking 4.2 million acre feet per year, or if I got the math right, 1.3 trillion gallons per year. So what crops is this actually going to? Crops like alfalfa, which are feed crops. I mean, you might've had an alfalfa sprout occasionally, but that's not what this water is being used for. It's livestock feed. And from Earl Creech, an agronomist with Utah State University's Extension Service, quote, alfalfa is the number one crop in Utah. And thankfully we do have another pie chart breakdown of what crops this water is going to. And yes, from the USDA in Utah, it is 47.5% alfalfa, 22.7% pasture irrigation, now about 16% grass hay, and 6.7 and 5.8 field crops and grain slash seeds. With some quick math, you might realize that at the bare minimum, 86% of that irrigation water is being used for animal agriculture. And it's possible also that the majority of those grains and seeds and other crops are being grown for feed as well. At minimum, 70% of all of Utah's water is being used for livestock. And that upper darker red line is sort of a theoretical maximum if those other grain and crop groups, which include soy and corn, were all animal feed, that would be 80% of all water. Whew. And that Republican lawmaker that said it was an environmental nuclear bomb happens to be a rancher. 
plays a bigger role, which we'll cover in a little bit later on. And very importantly here, this sector yields very little of the total of Utah's economy. We're talking about less than 3% despite using the majority of their water. So the majority of what is sucking the Great Salt Lake dry is providing an almost insignificant amount of economic value. <laughs> All right, now for a quick break with today's sponsor, Seed DS01 Daily Symbiotic. And we're also going to be covering the difference between it and digestive enzymes, which I think you guys will find interesting. In case you didn't know, Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic is a prebiotic and probiotic combined with 24 select strains of bacteria that have been scientifically shown to support a ton of things, such as gastrointestinal function, gut immunity, gut barrier health, as well as dermatological health, micronutrient synthesis, and cardiovascular health. All things that we wanna keep going well since we've been traveling a lot lately, so these have been very helpful. Now let's get to the difference between those digestive enzymes and seeds DS01 daily symbiotic, which contains a prebiotic and probiotic. And the prebiotic component of Seed's Daily Symbiotic is a plant-based prebiotic compound that is biotransformed by gut bacteria into beneficial metabolites, which help drive mitophagy, a process which manages the recycling of defective mitochondria in our cells fun stuff. Digestive enzymes, on the other hand, are usually plant-based compounds that help break apart things like protein and fats and carbohydrates in food, helping facilitate digestion. So Seeds DS01 is just entirely different. It's not meant to replace a digestive enzyme. And if you'd like to try it out, of course, you can click the link below and use the code MIKE15 at checkout for 15% off your first month supply of Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic. So what about that residential water use? Well, by contrast to that agriculture, we're talking about 10% total being residential with 6% of that being outdoor use and 4% of that being indoor use. I also think it's good to take a little bit of an aerial tour here because looking at the Great Salt Lake watershed along the rivers that feed it, you can see massive feed farming operations that are just too green for the surrounding landscape. You can also see huge dairy operations surrounded by green fields that are obviously sucking precious water from the Bear River, for example. And it's also worth mentioning that the biggest concern here is the Great Salt Lake watershed that feeds into that lake. And it even goes out of the state into say Idaho where there are again, large feed growing operations. Now for the population growth concerns, a skeptic might open the Utah Foundation report and say, hey, that raw data was from 2017. Population growth has been huge since then. Well, from 2017 to 2022, Utah went from about three to 3.5 million or 15% growth. Let's say that translated to all non-agriculture water use growth. Well, 15% growth on 0.95 million acre feet of water goes to 1.09. So if ag stays the same at 4.2, ag goes just from 82% of total down to 80% of total water usage. So no, the new population is not draining the lake. Sorry, it's still animal ag. All right, now let's look closer at that lake bed with the amazing work of Perry and also the historic lessons from Owens Lake. It's worth mentioning that just PM10 itself as a particulate is harmful regardless of how toxic it is. And Owens Lake, yeah, according to the EPA, has PM10 levels 130 times higher than is healthy. But we do need to talk about arsenic because it's possibly the main threat here. And we don't need to dwell too much on it. We know it's bad, but from this study on the topic, quote, inorganic arsenic has been confirmed as a human carcinogen that can include skin, lung, and bladder cancer. So looking to arsenic levels back at Owens Lake from the US Geological Survey, we're talking at about 50 parts per million on average for that lake bed. So we can look to the research of Perry to get an answer for Great Salt Lake. As this chart in his massive study mentions, we're talking about an average of 37 parts per million, which is a little bit lower, but very comparable. And we're talking about a lake that is roughly 30 times larger initially. And I'm gonna be honest, the way that these articles were written made it seem that if the lake shrunk more, then there would be a risk, but it is the case that 70% of it's already exposed and Perry and his team went around and measured the arsenic levels everywhere. 
So we actually have a heat map like this showing the arsenic concentrations. And we have to mention that there are some pretty high arsenic concentrations toward the south of the lake, which is closer to the larger population of Salt Lake City. Pair your gray, but maybe don't just like kick the toxic dust up. And he also has a lead map, which is even closer to all the other populations, not looking good. And they went around with their little dust machine and found these areas were the ones that were vulnerable to dust storms, you know, where the crust is worn away, hot spots, if you will. But I just wanna say that his 2019 paper was over 300 pages long, so this guy and his team deserve a medal. Now I wanna quickly talk about legislation because there are some laws that have been passed to try and fight this. We have 11 recent bills, like a $40 million fund for habitat restoration, which is obviously great. Also have habitat monitoring by the Army Corps of Engineers. But in terms of stopping the lion's share of what's sucking this up, we have a bill like HB 0423 that sets aside $3 million to loan out to farmers to improve their watering system efficiency. I don't think that's gonna do it. Not only do farmers have to elect to take on debt, but when you have $3 million with you know two to $3,000 an acre to put in drip irrigation and alfalfa fields, it's not gonna go very far. You know, there are some more laws, but I don't think any of them are gonna stop animal agriculture from guzzling the lake dry at this rate. And that brings me to that Republican lawmaker that said it was a environmental nuclear bomb potentially. And here he is. Five generations, his family has been using water from the river to grow food and raise cattle. Every gallon you take out of the Bear River is a gallon that doesn't go to the lake. At the same time, we have a, a way of life. You know, we have water rights to take that water. You heard it from him. He thinks it's a way of life and that he has a right to take that water out. Now, he is gonna be given the position of the executive director of the Department of Natural Resources or you know, in charge of conserving water. And he is all about pushing efficiency as a solution. And so what we try to do is we say, let's reduce the amount of water that we're taking out of the bear by doing irrigation efficiency practices. But it's interesting to see his view on residential people compared to his own farming practices. What's it like when you drive through the suburbs <laughs> and see those green lawns and flower gardens. What do you think? There's not a lot of economic value derived from that. It makes people feel good to have a green lawn. You know, we're not the countryside of England. We're the West. We're, we're, Utah is the second driest state in the country and we need to probably act like we are. So on one hand, he's telling people who are in residential areas to not pretend like you're living in some lush area and try to water everything. I agree, they shouldn't be watering lawns. I'm anti-lawn too. But he seems to also be denying that it's ridiculous to try and feed all of these animals in a desert situation. So more efficient animal production in the desert might be a bit like clean coal, where it's not really a solution. So he's calling for dramatic action, but the dramatic action that they likely need is to just stop what he considers his way of life, which I really don't think he's going to do. But let's move on to some potential other solutions. First of all, I consider this a natural disaster on the scale of like having a nuclear power plant meltdown right next to a city. I think that the federal government should essentially step in, take all of these people that are growing feed and using all this water and just tell them to essentially stop and just pay them what they would be paid. I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous. Then turn that into some type of program where they can transition into you know, growing crops that are meant to be in deserts or setting up things like greenhouses that use very little water and grow more high valued crops. Because the fact of the matter is if it was a $3.5 billion project in California before inflation and we've already exposed 20 times the size of that smaller lake, we're talking about what, like a 60 billion, 80 billion dollar project to remediate this? There are some other more creative solutions as well, which I think are really just band-aids at the end of the day. But you could try doing things like setting up biological crusts. I've been to Moab, Utah, where they have these protected crusts you're not allowed to step on, otherwise they could lead to dust. You could try and find some high salt tolerant fungi and bacteria and create a spray and just try and spray and see what happens. You could also put like crosshatch dust catches where the toxic zones are and hopefully that'll stop some dust as well as of course just putting the gravel over those like they've been doing to remediate it you know, over there at Owens Lake. But again, stopping animal ag would let the water level certainly rise. I mean, looking to a chart like this, you could just see how animal agriculture over the last decades has just been eating away 
at the water that's headed for the Great Salt Lake and imagine that coming back. In the end, it appears that the livestock industry in the area is drinking the Great Salt Lake dry more than any other forest. People have mentioned, oh, agriculture, but no one's realizing how specific the use is here and just how little of the economy this is. Again, less than 3%. And it should be enough to just say this arsenic cloud that is likely to come is going to do a ton of damage in terms of cancer and health, lung health, and on and on. But do I have to say that with repeated toxic clouds, there could just be a mass evacuation of Salt Lake City and the surrounding area, which would definitely collapse the economy and do way more billions of dollars in damage beyond that. But we also can't forget those migratory birds, just the weather patterns and on and on, and really this is one more reason why, after studying environmentalism, bachelors of science in my undergrad, I ended up going vegan was because the environmental impact and environmental inefficiency of growing animals to eat is just horrible. So yeah, they should stop trying to grow, feed for, and farm animals in the desert over there in Utah. And finally, if you would like to try out Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, then feel free to click the link below and use the code MIKE15 at checkout for 15% off your first month's supply. And finally, let me know what you think about all this. I learned a lot. I went really deep into this and I was like, I gotta keep this video shorter and just stop. So feel free to like the video, share it. I think it's an important topic and subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you next time.